Hello and welcome to the video lecture for week one of GEM 123. The reason for the video is that we've been preempted by the Martin Luther King holiday. I'm sure you're pretty eager to get going with SolidWorks, so let's dive in. Uh, right now I have nothing running. I'm going to click on SolidWorks itself. It may be available from your menu. You may have an icon on the screen. I have one down on my uh, quick launch taskbar at the bottom. It could take a few seconds. It could take upwards of a minute, depending on the kind of machine you're running on. Eventually, you will have the SolidWorks screen in front of you with nothing yet open. You're not working on anything. One of the things that we'll be learning today are the primary screen elements for SolidWorks. Up at the top is the menu bar. It looks a little different than maybe some of the other Windows applications you've used. If you go over to the left here, you see this triangle. Let me click away from it. This triangle right here will bring up a fairly conventional file view tools and help menu bar. And you can see as I move, uh, I have access to uh, what a fairly normal Windows app. If you click away from it, you'll see that there are some other icons that are here to accelerate your use. For example, if you want to create a new document, you would click here. If you want to open an existing one here, uh, that's what I'll do initially just to begin to describe some of the primary screen elements of, uh, of this program. I'll open up a part, an existing part. This happens to be part of a garage door opener. Uh, something I had to re reverse engineer. And you'll see up into the graphics area or the working area is a representation of that part shown uh, in a nice three-dimensional way. Now is the time for you to begin to get comfortable with your mouse. If you're using the recommended kind of mouse with, with two buttons and a scroll wheel, you'll find that you can rotate the view, pan it, uh, zoom in and out quite easily. Much of what you'll be doing with uh, uh, to do this is with the uh, the scroll wheel itself. For example, if I move the wheel or scroll the wheel, just turning it, I'm not pushing the wheel, I'm just turning it. If I turn it away from me, as in pushing it up, uh, the view shrinks. If I roll it towards me, uh, it enlarges. If I click and hold the scroll wheel, I can now, in a freeform way, rotate the view of the part. If I release, it stops wherever I left it off. If I push and hold the control key on the keyboard, which I'm doing right now, and then push the scroll wheel, I can drag the part, I can pan it around in the view. I'm not actually moving the part, I'm just uh, changing how it's being viewed uh, by me. Uh, up on the menu bar, I, one of the things that I like to do, this is optional for you, but uh, I find I like to keep the the menu bar itself pinned. So I'll go up to the right, ar right arrow and then push the little push pin, which keeps the menu bar always visible. Again, this is optional, but uh, it makes it a little quicker for me. So uh, moving on, uh, Here's, let's talk about some of the screen elements. Now that I have a part in front of me, uh, we've already talked about the menu bar. Over here, these tabs, if I click on one of them, you'll see that the, uh, the command manager, which is this area above it, the command manager changes, showing me the different tools and actions that are available to me right now. So if I click on Evaluate, I get a certain set. If I click on Sketch or Features, I get things that are pertinent to those. You can modify this toolbar. If I right-click on it, you can tell it which items to add or remove. Let's say, for example, I don't want this SolidWorks MBD on here. I would uncheck that and notice that it goes away. Okay, other items here, this is this these icons here are the heads up toolbar. Uh these are quite wonderful. You can modify all of these by the way. You can add and uh remove things, you can change the order of things 
in all of these menus. This heads up toolbar, uh, much of what it uh, uh, does is to sh uh, change, allow you to change how things look on the screen. You can do a section view here. Uh, many times you want to change your view orientation. Instead of using the uh, scroll wheel to change it, you can use this. Uh, if you select it, you can pick certain pre-programmed orientations. See how I'm just moving around on this uh, truncated uh, square. And as I click on different, not, I'm not even clicking, I'm just moving. If I were to click, uh, you can see a representation in the upper right corner. Uh, that's what my view would look like. So if I want to look at the back, I can go over to here, uh, the top, and so on. Uh, so this is one way, a good way, to change the uh, view orientation. So if I click here, now I'm looking at a fairly isometric kind of presentation. As I mentioned, the command manager up here is context sensitive. Depending on what you're doing, uh, some things may be grayed out or available. Uh, you'll see when we start to create a new part that the number of things that are available is quite restricted. Over on the left here, you can see this thing that I'm scrolling right now. Uh, at present, the tab that's selected is the Feature Manager Design Tree. Now, there are other tabs here. We won't be covering them today, but they know that they are available. Uh, I can size this if I want to make it larger or smaller. And what this is is a chronologic history of operations that I have done in order to create this part, uh, with the most recent being at the bottom. And as I hover over each of them, you can see it shows me not only you can see the highlighting, you see the orange highlighting out here, you can see the areas of action. There's a boss, there's a cut, a fillet. We'll talk about what, the, what all these things are shortly. Another fillet. Now, because I've enabled um, uh, this uh, uh, view, this dynamic view, uh, this hierarchical view, as I hover over each of the items, it will show you with, see those arrows that appear, what are the parent or child uh, dependencies that exist. So, for example, this fillet is dependent on a mirror, a boss, and another boss. So as I go up, you can see, now this will be useful when you want to change things. Uh, you'll know that uh, what other features will influence or what it might influence uh, when you change it. Uh, again, we'll talk about that more at a later uh, time. Down here is the reference triad. You can see that it shows X, Y, and Z. As I rotate the part view, it shows me which orientation it's in. Notice if I go to a normal view, let's, uh, now one other thing that I'm going to show you, if you push the space bar at any time, it brings up the orientation window and it allows me to um, do very similar things to what the, uh, the heads up toolbar allowed, plus a little bit more. If I want to do normal to that surface, normal being perpendicular, I would click on that. So now I'm looking at it head on. And you can see that uh, it's presented uh, as if I was my eye was looking straight at this surface. I'm highlight, I'm moving my mouse over it. And I was at a very, very far distance and effectively infinitely far away. So I'll do it one more time. Bring up the orientation window click on normal view. All right, so now I'm looking at it as a normal view. Uh, moving on, uh, down on the, at the bottom is the status bar. It tells me what mode I'm in. Now, there are two modes. There's the editing part mode. And when we get into it, you'll see that there's an editing sketch mode uh, when we start to create a new part. By the way, just for your information, this uh, document that I'm referring to right now is the uh, SOLIDWORKS screen elements document. And 
you'll see that it uh, describes by name what these items are that I'm talking about. And so if you uh, want to refer to this, uh, please do so. So you can see down at the bottom is the task, uh, pardon me, the status bar. And in that, it shows you a variety of things, uh, some quite helpful. Let's say, for instance, that you want to work in millimeters instead of inches. You see this IPS, it's currently the current unit is inch, pound, seconds. Uh, so as I add features to this, they're automatically dimensioned in inches. If instead I want to have this be presented in a millimeter form, I can choose one of the others, say millimeter, gram, second. And now any features that are dimensioned would be in millimeters. So uh, again, going back to the uh, screen layout, so we've already mentioned the Feature Manager Design Tree, the Reference Triad, the Status Bar, the Graphic Area. Um, I think I've hit most of the high points. Now, as certainly as we get to know SolidWorks more, you'll see that there are many other elements to the screen, but these are the basics. Um, one of the things I'd like to mention to you is I'm going to bring over the, um, the Moodle page for a moment. Uh, there is a video here on how to configure SolidWorks menus for this class. Um, I'm asking every student to not get creative, particularly as it relates to configuring the menus and the screen layout. Uh, it'll make things much harder for your TAs to help you and me to help you. So basically, leave things as they are. Don't, for example, move the command manager around. Uh, because that will uh, that will make things harder to find. Don't go into expert mode, that kind of thing. Once you finish this class and you're out on your own, you can change it any way you like, but uh, please leave them as they are. And do view this, midi uh, this video. So uh, let's go back to SolidWorks and talk about how to create a new part and then begin to uh, do some very basic sketching and, and some of the things that uh, you'll become aware of. So you can do File, New, or you can go over to the new icon over here to the right. I'm going to do that. And once you've done so, you'll see that there are three kinds of objects that you can create. Right now, we're going to be creating an individual part, but you could later create an assembly or a drawing, those are for later lectures. So we'll create a part. We've already clicked on it. Notice that it has this highlight around it. If I were to do an assembly, it would look like that. So we're going to do a part, and I'll click on OK. Now that we have a new part that has begun, there's nothing in the graphics or work area. Let's begin to, begin to create the details, create the solids, and so on. The two options that are available on the Command Manager, remembering that we're looking at features right now, are Extruded Boss Space and Revolve Boss Space. Both of them are an additive way of creating a solid. I will choose Extruded Boss Space, which in plain English means I'm going to create a sketch which has enclosed areas, and then I'm going to extrude from that those areas to create a solid. So uh, the first thing it wants me to do is to create that sketch. And since every sketch has to live on a plane, it's offering me the three available planes, which is the front, top, and right plane. I'm going to draw on the front plane, so I'll move over to that, click once with my left mouse button, and notice that it rotates the view to be normal to my eye. And so now I can begin to do my sketching. We'll be talking next week about all the various sketch tools. Today we'll use line or rectangle. That's all. So let's start with the line tool. And we'll talk about how geometric relations are created and how they're displayed. If you look at the cursor now, as I am out in the work area, notice that it looks like a pencil and that there's a little line icon next to it. If I click once and release, I've now begun the line, 
and as I drag away you'll see that in a rubber band fashion the line projects from that point. If I move above or near a particular feature like for example the origin notice that if I'm in this region I'm now horizontal from the origin or vertical from the origin what that means is that if I were to click right there I'd be creating a point that has some kind of geometric geometric relation with the origin let's avoid that for a moment and just continue to look at how the line tool behaves as I'm dragging it around notice for instance as I drag closer and closer to being true horizontal at some point it will snap and you see that little yellow flag below my cursor to the below and to the right of my cursor that looks like a horizontal line that means that when I were to click if I were to click again that line will be created at a given length which I can change but more important it will have our first uh, geometric sketch relation which in this case would mean horizontal now I'm not clicking yet I will move to a vertical orientation and notice the same thing there's a, an indicator in yellow showing that if I click here that line will have a vertical geometric relation so let's do that I'll click right here and sure enough if you look to the right of the line there's a green flag with a vertical bar in it telling me that that line has a geometric relation already applied to it so I'll move around now notice when I clicked if I click 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 you know I can go click 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 and create this sequence of lines at a fairly random way so I'm going to do click 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 and eventually get back to my original point which is right here now if I click again here notice that I have enclosed a complete area when I click now it shows as a shaded contour this area if I were to if I want to delete one of the lines let's say I push escape come out of line mode if I click on one of the lines and then either right click and push delete or push the delete key on my keyboard now that now it is no longer an enclosed contour and the shading goes away also notice that the lines are shown in blue that means that they're not fully defined they are underdefined and if I were to click on an endpoint I can move them freely and click even on the line itself and I can click and drag the line and in doing so uh, change the shape in a free form way uh, let me add a line to this I'll click on the line tool click on there and I'll re-enclose the line so there I am with an enclosed shape uh, nothing special it's just a shape if I were to conclude this line session or the sketch session I I would can go up to I can exit sketch or I can go to the upper right corner and I have two tools here there's an a green arrow to accept the sketch as I've shown it there's also a red X which will discard any changes I made to the sketch and then because this is a brand new sketch it will actually delete the sketch uh, just for your information down on the status bar you can see I'm in editing sketch mode remember I mentioned that there are two modes well in, I'm in the editing sketch mode once I click on the green arrow it will finish the sketch and take me automatically to the dialog where it's going to ask about the extrusion now I do have a shaded sketch area it looks good I haven't dimensioned anything yet but let's say this is what I want so I'll click on the green arrow and it rotates the view a little bit to show me the solid that would be created if I went ahead and accepted it right now observe that it is the shape 
that the uh, the contour is retained, but now it has a solidness to it. Uh, it currently is one tenth of an inch, 0.1 inches thick. It is a blind extrusion, which means it goes to from the existing sketch in a certain direction in a blind way by whatever the amount plugged into here. So if I want to increase it by a tenth of an inch, I can push the up arrow here, go to 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on. That's one way to affect the amount uh, of the depth of the extrusion. I could also do it by grabbing the arrow. See this arrow as I hover over it? I can drag this. See the ruler that shows up? If I move my mouse pointer over the ruler, it will move according to the tick marks on the ruler, just like a, an ordinary ruler. Uh, here I can free form move it, tick marks, um, and you also can move it uh, to the major numbers, and there's ways to do that as well. So uh, let's say I know that I want it to be an inch and a half, so 1.5, I'll punch it in from the keyboard, and as soon as I press Enter, it will show it in the preview. It hasn't yet accepted it. Uh, to finish this, I would either check this green mark here or in the upper right corner. And now I've accepted it. And there is my solid, uh, which is nothing more than an extruded version of the sketch that I created a moment ago. So we've done a very quick look at some of the uh, geometric uh, relations. We've done a quick look at the extrude feature. Uh, again, this is not meant to be a, a very substantial demo, just to kind of get you started. Let's go back. Let's create a fresh sketch. This time, we'll create a sketch on one of the surfaces. So instead of choosing the front, top, or right plane, which I can see any time here, by the way, I will instead choose one of the planes that are formed here, like I'll choose this fellow here. So I'm going to do now an extruded cut, which is a different kind of operation. Well, if extruded boss is to add material, extruded cut is to remove material. So we'll go to extruded cut, click on that, and it's asking me for a plane on which to sketch. And I'm going to click on this plane. Notice it didn't change the view orientation. I can do that at any time. For example, if I want to look at it in a normal way, I would select that surface, press the space bar, and go over here to Normal To. And it will rotate the view so that when I sketch on it, they'll look in the actual shape that I'm drawing. And you'll see what the difference is in a moment. Let's go over to rectangle. I'm going to draw a corner rectangle, which means my first click will be one corner. And then I'll click again and create the opposing corner right there. Now, a couple of things to point out. A lot just happened, by the way. What it did was to create the rectangle that I clicked on. Because it is an enclosed area, by definition, a rectangle is an enclosed area, so it showed it as a shaded or gray thing. Uh, what you didn't see, because it went by very quickly, let's create, I'm going to drag the, uh, make this a little bit smaller, we'll create another rectangle, and you see that there's an option here uh, to create or not to create these construction lines. These can be handy, it creates two lines and a center point. You might not want that. So let's go back to the corner rectangle tool. Notice we're doing a corner rectangle, which is this selection up in the corner. And I'm going to turn off the construction lines and uncheck it. So now if I click and click again, yes, it creates the rectangle. It is a shaded contour, but it does not create those construction lines. Uh, Maybe what you want, it's up to you. So now I have these two rectangles. I can press the Escape key to come out of this mode, or I can click the green arrow here. And here I am with two rectangles that have been drawn 
on that surface. Because they're shaded, I can drag them around by simply clicking inside of that region. Notice I can click and move it. Same thing with this fellow over here. Uh, we're not doing any dimensioning today. We'll do that uh, at a later time. Let's say I'm happy with that, and I want to now do the extruded cut. I will accept this sketch. And right now it's doing what's called a blind cut. Let's say instead I want to go through all. So no matter what, I'm going to go through the entire thing. And you'll see that it's going to intersect that little corner there. That's OK. That may be what you want. And I'll accept it. And there I am with my extruded cut. So it used that sketch. It's a sketch-based uh, feature. And it cut all the way through the part, normal to the sketch. You don't have to be normal, but in this case, I am. And it goes all the way through the part. And you can see from both sides that, in fact, uh, that hole is uh, done. Over on the feature tree, you can see the order of events. I did first did the boss extrude, and then I did the cut. And in fact, they show up in the feature tree as I had done them. If I click the right arrow on the boss extrude, notice that the sketch from which it emanated is now uh, uh, selectable. If I right click on that, I can go in and edit the sketch. And I'm back pretty much where I was a moment ago. I can rotate the view or make it, I can go normal to it. If I push the space bar, I can go normal to that sketch. And let's say that I want to make that this line and this line, I'm just selecting them one at a time, I want them to be parallel to each other. And you'll see why in just a moment. That will mean that, that the, the surfaces that are uh, produced by the extrude will then also be parallel. So I'll click, click away from everything. That's how you can unselect. And I'm going to click just once on that line. And then holding the Shift key down on my keyboard, click on the bottom line. And I'm given a variety of relations that I can choose from. And notice one of them is bolded, because SolidWorks thinks it might know which one I really want to do. And it's right in this case. I want to make them parallel. So watch me as I click parallel. They will change orientation slightly. Ready? Here we go. OK. Now the two lines are parallel. I will accept it and observe these green flags. There's a parallel flag here and a parallel flag here that illustrate and uh, tell you definitively that there is now a geometric relation between them and that they are parallel. You'll get to know these what these flags mean over time. I will accept the sketch, come back out. And now these two surfaces, the top and what I'm calling the bottom, are now parallel to each other. That can be useful for creating a reference geometry, which we're going to do next. Remember that a plane is a, uh, a flat uh, a reference surface upon which sketches can be created. What if you say that you want a reference plane that bisects that, that surface up here and this one down here? How would you create it? Well, we'll click away from both of them, click on Reference Geometry, Plane, and now it's waiting for some references. I'm going to give it the top one. Now, if I stopped here, it would be creating a reference plane that is offset, as you see here, by 0.1 inches up away from the top. But that isn't what I want. I want a plane that is halfway between the top and the bottom. So I'm going to create a second reference, which is the bottom. And SolidWorks is pretty smart in this area. It says, OK, I understand what you mean. I see that you want a plane that is halfway between those two. And if I accept it here, which I'm going to do, now I have this reference plane that is halfway uh, between those two original surfaces in the solid. And I can use that plane 
for creating sketches and other features. Now we're finally ready to do a little bit of dimensioning. We're going to create a new part and begin from there. Instead of creating an extruded boss, let's start by creating just a sketch. You're allowed to do that. You go to the Sketch tab, click on Sketch. Once again, it asks me what plane to put it on. I'm going to put it on the top plane this time. And we'll talk about not only how to dimension, but about the various geometric sketch relations that can exist. I will create a rectangle. And notice right away that it has a vertical and a horizontal sketch, a geometric relation already applied. You can see them in the green, little green flags. If I now draw a line from here, and I notice I'm going to drag it out horizontally, and then I'll continue dragging straight down. So now I've created this corner feature. How do I end a line? I can double click or press escape. I'm going to double click. I'm still in line mode. If I want to come out of line mode altogether, I press the escape key, and that's where I am right now. Let's do some dimensioning. There's a tool up on the command manager called Smart Dimension. If I click on that, the cursor change, changes appearance to look like a dimensioning tool. And a very simple thing to do would be to click on a line. Let's not click on the center or on one of the edges yet. Just click on the line itself and drag away from the line. Notice I see a number. I have the extension lines, which are the two lines top and bottom, and I have my dimension lines with arrows on them. So here I am. I'll click, and up comes a, a dimension modify uh, window. And in that window, I have uh, several things I can do, but probably the most important is that I can highlight the number and type in directly. Let's say I want it to be 3, whatever the units are. Now we happen to be inches, so it'll be 3 inches. And it will automatically scale. The, the, the first dimension you apply will automatically scale the rest of the drawing. So now I've got this 3-inch dimension on here. I am still in dimension mode. Look at the cursor. That's your clue. You can also see there's a dimension dialog over on the left. Let's dimension the top. See that it's currently 4.96. I'll make it around 5 and press Enter. Now let's say that I want to dimension from this line to this line. In other words, I want to dimension a portion of this edge. If I were to click on that edge right now, notice it'll dimension the entire thing. That's not what I want. I want to dimension basically from that point to that point. So I can. there's no longer a, an easy edge for me to just click on. Let's go back into dimension mode. And I can, for example, now click on the top edge. Well, if I don't do anything more, it's going to try to, try to create another dimension. That's not what I want. I want to, my second reference is this line down here. It understands that. And now I drag it off to the side, and I'll enter 1.25 or whatever you want it to be. And that's how you would dimension from a feature to a feature, like a line to a line. You could also do, for example, a line to a point. So I'm still in dimensioning mode. I can dimension from here to that point right there and have a similar effect. Okay, I'll change that to 3. What if I do something that might seem a little wrong? I hope, I hope you think it's wrong once you see me trying to do it. I'm going to Smart Dimension, and I'm going to dimension from this line to this line. Now, ordinarily, if there were no other dimensions here, that would be OK. But if I click here and try to create it, I get a, a complaint. 
And it says that this dimension that you're about to add um, will over-define the sketch. Well, why will it do that? If you look at it, if you were to numerically add this number that I'm starting to enter, the dimension above that's shown in yellow, that would somehow try to override the dimension on the far left, which is the numeric sum of the two. So you have a choice to make it a driven dimension, which means it's a reference dimension only. You can't edit it. Or you can make it a driving dimension, in which case it will allow you to delete one of the other conflicting dimensions. Ordinarily, you don't do this. When you see this error, the answer is cancel. Don't add that dimension. Uh, later on in the course, we may talk about how to add reference dimensioning. So if you look down at the bottom, it still says that the sketch is underdefined. Well, let's see if we can find out what's underdefined about it. Uh, one of the ways to find out that's come out of dimension mode is to try to try to drag things. Now I click on that corner. Hmm. I can move it, but does the shape change? Not really. I can click on this line. Does the shape change? Basically, from a dimensional point of view, everything is defined. But what isn't defined is the position. That's what's moving around. You know, it's not changing shape. I'll click on all the lines. I can't change the shape, but I can certainly move it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it geometrically aligned to the origin. So I'll click on the origin, click on the corner. I'm going to make them coincident. And now, finally, if I'm going to zoom around a little bit, if I accept that, it says fully defined. Now I have a fully defined sketch. Let's go over some of the geometric relations that can exist. We've talked about vertical. This line can be vertical. Um, let's do another kind of vertical. Let's draw another rectangle out in space. And I will make this point vertical from that point. If I do so and accept it, there's now a vertical relation between that point and that one. Now that I've created a relation between this corner and that corner, a horizontal, uh, pardon me, a vertical relation, you can see the, I'm highlighting right here, there's a vertical geometric relation between them. Uh, the part is still underdefined because this rectangle, this uh, shape is not dimensioned yet. We will do that in a moment. But it's also under, underdefined because this can move. See, I can move it vertically as well as uh, change the shape. Let's nail it down uh, so that it cannot move uh, up and down as well. And once again, we'll add a geometric relation. I'll choose this corner here. Shift on my keyboard choose this corner here and add a horizontal relation. Accept that. And notice now, again, we have these new flags showing up. Are we yet fully defined? Not yet, because still this part, this uh, rectangle, can change in shape. So let's add a dimension. Go to Smart Dimension. We'll dimension the height. Accept that. Dimension the width. And watch, watch down here. Watch in the uh, defined area on the status bar. Once I accept this dimension, it becomes fully defined once again. So that's how I would add a vertical or a horizontal geometric constraint. Let's go over to some circular features. Create a couple of circles. Let's uh, zoom out a little bit. Use the control key to move things out of the way. We'll work over here. Click and drag. I've created a circle. It's not yet dimensioned. 
I'll create another circle. Now notice again that circles, because they are fully enclosed, have a shaded contour. And I've got these two circles, and they are free to move. So if I click on the center or click in the shaded area, I can move it. Of course, I can click on the edge and change the size. But more to the point, let's talk about a concentric geometric relation. I want these two circles to share a center. Well, just like when I was trying to uh, add a geometric relation between straight lines, I can click on a circle, do Shift, click on another circle, and among the choices I have, I can make them equal, which will make them equal in size, but not move them, or I can make them concentric, which is what I really want to do. So if I click on concentric, they now are together you'll see a concentric flag and now when I move them they move as a pair because they are concentric. So we've done vertical, concentric, uh, let's do some perpendicular. I'll draw a line, a random line. I'll draw another line segment off of that. Press escape to finish it. I want this line to be perpendicular to that line segment. So I will click on one line, shift, click on the other one. Now this time, let's pay attention to this handy menu that shows up. Yes, I can certainly do it over here on the side, but I'll press escape one more time, shift, click, and click, and up comes this very readily accessible menu with all the different constraints that are available, one of which is make perpendicular. So I do that, I'll accept it, and sure enough, there's a perpendicular uh, marker here, a little flag saying that they are perpendicular. I mentioned earlier about making things equal. Let's make these two line segments equal to each other. I'll sh click on one, shift click on the other one, and let's see. Well, we have horizontal, no, vertical, no, linear, collinear, nope, don't want that. Ah, here it is. Make them equal. I'll click on that, and now they're equal in length. As you've seen when we've been drawing our lines, we've been doing mostly a click, a release, drag, click, release, drag, and so on, and this will create a chain of line segments. Let's say that what you want to create is one or more unconnected line segments, not a chain, but individual lines. So I'll click on my line tool, and instead of clicking and releasing, I'll click, hold the mouse button down, drag to a position, and release. And what that will do is to create a line segment, but not to begin and automatically begin the next line emanating from the, the last point. So if I create a line now, Again, click, drag, release, and now I'm going to press escape to come out of line mode. Here I am with two lines that are not in any way connected. Let's say, however, that I want this point to live somewhere on that line. How would I do that? Well, I can simply drag it and it will attach. That's one way to create what's called a coincident um, relation. Another way would be to click on the point, click on the line, and make them coincident over here. And it has a similar effect. And you can see now that a coincident relation exists between them. Another uh, a relation that can exist often between a line and a curve is a tangent relation. I'm going to drag this line out a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. Uh, let's delete these up here. Now, I don't know if I showed you this earlier, but if I, let's come out of this, and if I highlight dragging from the right, notice it highlighted all of those lines, and if I were to push the delete key, now there's a difference. If I click from the and drag from the left, it will highlight only the fully enclosed shape. 
if I click and drag from the right, it will highlight every intersected line or feature. I'll push the delete key and now it's gone. So I've got this line up here, I've got a curve, and I want to make this line tangent to that curve. So I'll click on the line, click on the curve, and the highlighted option is to make them tangent. And it chose to do it, instead of by moving the line, it enlarged the circle. That may not have been what I wanted. So I'm going to escape out. I'm going to undo. Well, how would I prevent the line, the circle, from changing shape? Well, of course, I need to add a dimension to it. So I go into my Smart Dimension mode, click on Smart Dimension, click on the circle, add a dimension to it. I'll accept what it is right now. Come out of that mode. Now when I click on the line and the circle and make them tangent, it they move rather than sizing the circle they move as necessary to get together. So uh, one more geometric sketch relation and then we'll be done for this group when I want to make two things collinear. I'm going to draw a rectangle on the on the, uh, the work area and let's say that I want to make this line collinear with the bottom of that rectangle. Collinear means that they share the same line. Now they don't have to intersect. As a matter of fact, I'm going to intentionally size this rectangle down so that they probably won't intersect, but they can still be collinear. So I'll click on the bottom, click on that line, make them collinear, and accept it. So now you can see the dashed line and there's a collinear constraint which I hover over and you can see how the line is related to the bottom of that rectangle. So what have we done? We've done vertical, we've done concentric, perpendicular over here, you can see the perpendicular. We've done parallel. If we uh, move over here uh, we can see that well we, we actually we don't have a parallel constraint shown here yet but there was one on the other part. Let's create one here. I'll create a line segment and another line segment. I'll click on one, shift click on the other, make them parallel, and now you can see the parallel constraint between them. Uh, we did equal between these two line segments. You can see the equal mark. We did horizontal. That horizontal mark is right there. Uh, let's get normal to our view here. I like to see it just like that. You can see the horizontal constraint. Uh, we did coincident right there. We did tangent up here. Tangent, by the way, just like uh, collinear, tangent does not have to intersect. It's more a direction than it, and you know, and that if you were to extend the line, they would touch in only one point but they don't have to be touching. And we did collinear between that line segment and the bottom here. Okay, now we've gone through the list of geometric relations. Let's come out and we're going to talk a little bit about what's going on in lab this week. I will bring Moodle back over and let's go down to this week in lab. First of all, I mentioned uh, the primary screen elements are shown here. Uh, don't forget to look at it. Don't forget the task pane over on the right. I, I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, okay, here is the worksheet for this week where you'll be creating your first SolidWorks model. Now there's a lot of hand-holding going on here. If I click on the worksheet, I'll bring it over as a matter of fact from here, Here's the worksheet for this week. And I take you point by point through the creating of a sketch, create a rectangle, uh, you'll dimension it, you'll dimension vertically and horizontally, then you'll create a solid, and so on. So you work through the entire worksheet 
And at the very end, what we're asking you to do is to show the sketch on the screen to your TA in class. Uh, and they'll check you off and they'll make sure that it looks correct. Um, so that's worksheet one. I also provide a video of doing the entire worksheet. So if you get stumped or want to watch me actually, you know, walking my way through it, you can watch this video. The link is up on Moodle. There is a reference document here about uh, sketch relations. It's another review of all the geometric sketch relations, the ones that we've already talked about, and they're grouped by category. Um, hopefully this document is uh, going to load properly here. Uh, there we are. Okay, good. I'll fix it if I need to. So it shows the various constraints that can exist. And uh, so do walk through it. Uh, there will be questions on the quiz about constraints and what they mean. So going back to uh, Moodle for a second. Uh, I also have a video here about how to create reference planes for use with your sketches. I do provide a video on dimensioning within a sketch. And last but not least is the quiz for this week. That's pretty much it. I know I've run on kind of long here, but that was the lecture that was going to be for week zero or week one. Uh, if you have questions, please ask your TA. And if you cannot get the answers you need, uh, feel free to email me. And uh, hope you enjoy working with SolidWorks. Thank you for watching. This presentation is part of a series by Neil Rosenberg. Additional videos may be found on my channel at youtube.com.